Hello and welcome to Vion's Global Leadership Series. We are in the Japanese capital of Tokyo. It's a bright, sunny Tuesday morning, and we have with us a very special guest, the former Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, the longest serving Prime Minister of this country, the architect of modern day Japan's strategic posture, and the man who laid the foundation of the Quad as we know it right now. Mr. Abe, welcome to Vion. Yeah, so I've been looking forward to this uh, uh, you know, production. I'm very happy to be on the show. You resigned a couple of years back, sir, citing ill health. How are you doing now? Well, uh, as you have cited, uh, from July of about two years ago, my health has deteriorated uh, to some extent. However, uh, after I have stepped down from the prime ministership, um, the medicine uh, actually is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, effective uh, when it comes to my illness. So my condition is very good now. Barely a few kilometers from where we are sitting, the four quad leaders are having the second in-person meeting the second Quad Summit. What are your expectations from the Tokyo meeting? As uh, you have heard, I have always been um, the advocate uh, of this uh, uh, Quad uh, collaboration of uh, Japan, uh, India, uh, US and Australia. Uh, it's uh, very uh, useful for the four countries to unite together uh, for the stability and the safety uh, of the region. So uh, in terms of my efforts for this Quad relationship, it really started uh, back during the first administration starting in 2006. Uh, I've been uh, trying to put together this kind of uh, framework uh, on the diplomacy front uh, to tackle all the uh, regional issues. Uh, this uh, Indo-Pacific uh, relationship had grown uh, from the level uh, of uh, ministerial uh, cooperation uh, to the top leader cooperation. And furthermore, uh, since 2012, uh, we have uh, been engaged in uh, uh, Asia uh, Democratic uh, Movement uh, under the name of uh, uh, Security Diamond, and this uh, certainly has contributed largely to the stability and prosperity of the region of this uh, Indo-Pacific. So, in the backdrop, of course, we're seeing the Ukraine uh, crisis, uh, Russia is invading Ukraine, as you know, and uh, given that backdrop, of course, uh, there's a military consideration uh, within the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, region as well. It's uh, quite meaningful for the Quad leaders uh, to get together in a summit forum uh, to demonstrate the four uh, democratic countries' a strong stance uh, for the uh, stability and safety of the region. You mentioned Ukraine, uh, and while the Quad has achieved a lot and progressed a lot in the past few years uh, with vaccine uh, uh, cooperation and climate change and so on and so forth, do you think the Quad has done enough uh, to pursue its security goals? Yeah, of course, as I cited, you know, uh, the uh, uh, the scope of uh, cooperation uh, under the framework of Quad uh, is quite various. Uh, we include, uh, uh, you know, fighting COVID-19, acquiring vaccines, making sure people are vaccinated, and there is uh, always this issue uh, for the climate change that we need to tackle together. Uh, but at the same time, I think um, if you were to talk about the most recent issues that uh, we shall take very importantly, uh, it is uh, Russia's invasion into Ukraine. I think we need to strongly and that's not to say lightly uh, of the need to uh, secure economic stability vis-a-vis uh, -vis issues regarding supply chain and whatnot. But come back to the question of security goals and uh, the fact that the Quad uh, partners have been reluctant to even name their biggest security challenge uh, which is China. Uh, you know, the Quad has been accused of having an identity crisis. Some say it's the Asian Red Cross, others say it's the Asian NATO. Is the current format of the Quad what you envisioned in 2006 when you pushed for it? Well, uh, first of all, I need to clearly say that uh, the, the purpose, the objectives of uh, Quad is uh, entirely different from that of NATO, for example. So our stance naturally will be different. This Quad uh, collaboration is not to, say, name one country um, in crisis, which needs defense. 
uh, to, to support them uh, as a result of that. Such is not what we do. At the same time, of course, uh, Quad uh, takes it important for the fact that uh, uh, we are uh, the four uh, diplomatic, uh, uh, excuse me, democratic uh, countries in Indo Pacific region, and our values uh, should be uh, pronounced. And of course, for the four uh, countries to uh, work together uh, to commit to the, uh, the security uh, of the region uh, basically is the va very foundation uh, of uh, peace and stability. By uh, pronouncing our uh, values as such, uh, you know, China will be directed to act in, in the right direction. Today's newspapers in Japan, and I'm sure elsewhere as well, uh, talk about U.S. President Joe Biden reaffirming his commitment to defending Taiwan, only for the White House to uh, immediately clarify that their policy on Taiwan remains unchanged. Do you believe that the U.S. will militarily intervene if China were to invade Taiwan? Well, I think his comment was intentionally made, uh, but you must forget the fact that uh, he has in the past also made a similar uh, comment that uh, U.S. will be uh, you know, willing to uh, fully defend uh, Taiwan uh, if uh, China were to militarily uh, invade Taiwan. Uh, so, um, you know, that's on the very ground of uh, uh, staying uh, strategically ambiguous in terms of uh, policy. And on the very point that the White House came right out saying, oh, our policy of, um, you know, staying ambiguous uh, uh, strategically uh, has not changed. The fact that they uh, clarify that right after uh, President Biden's comment uh, actually gives us a signal that the U.S. is starting to uh, look at the change of the policy there. And I have been an advocate of changing this amb ambiguous strategy. Uh, at the time when the U.S. took this ambiguous strategy, uh, there was a huge gap of military power uh, between U.S. and China. But as we see China closing that gap very rapidly with a very strong military power uh, that they're building up, it's dangerous to keep this uh, policy in place. So I would, uh, uh, in consequence, uh, welcome President Biden's comment. Uh, his comment flatly would signal a change of uh, that uh, ambiguous strategy policy when it comes to China-Taiwan relationship. So let me understand this correctly. You're saying that with yesterday's statement, no matter what the White House has said in clarification, you believe that there is a shift in American policy vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. You know, this is uh, uh, actually a comment uh, given directly from uh, President Biden, and uh, he talked about uh, U.S.'s full commitment to defend uh, Taiwan, uh, even though the White House came out and denied, uh, you know, any overreaction to that, saying that it's the same policy. Uh, but I think essentially what President Biden had said shows the truth, and it was a message to China. Very interesting. Do you believe that Xi Jinping is going to uh, attack Taiwan and take it by force? Hello, oh. Of course, um, you know, Xi Jinping's policy of one China is out and clear, as it had been stated. And they have clearly shown that uh, uh, forceful um, action uh, by force uh, is one of the options that they might actually ex exercise. But if U.S. were to clearly uh, be in a position to um, interfere uh, with such action of uh, military invasion uh, by China, uh, I think China would uh, consequently have to give up the idea uh, because China certainly doesn't want to go into war with U.S. So what do you think the Chinese military is trying to do as they surround Taiwan, as the you know, satellite images have come out of them taking out uh, certain targets? Uh, do you think this is a pressure tactic? Do you think that uh, the Chinese president is preparing to mount some sort of an invasion while the world remains distracted with Ukraine, with supply chain disruptions, with economic pressures? 
またあの中国にとってベストなの,なのはですね。Well, what would be best scenario for China's perspective, of course, is for Taiwan to voluntarily become part of China, but such is not likely to occur. There are a couple of stories I can think of when it comes to how China、uh, would、uh, make happen one China story.、Uh, for example,、uh, China、uh, could be on a very forefront of uh, uh, trying to. Um, have an、uh, influence over Taiwan、uh, as it makes Taiwan situation unstable when it comes to、uh, political activities or economic activities.、Uh, however, on that very point, I must not forget to mention that the current administration in Taiwan、uh, is a popular administration.、Uh, there is quite a bit of stability when it comes to politics and economy.、Uh, but you know, things might happen, and when that change, Comes that would be a window of opportunity.、Uh, I think from the perspective of China,、uh, there is a, a great deal of influence、uh, to over Taiwan、uh, from China, of course, as you know, economically and also in terms of media control. When you say things might happen, are you suggesting that China might engineer political instability in Taiwan, and that would be the route that they would prefer? There are various possibilities. The fact that China and Taiwan speak the same language、uh, economically,、uh, they are relying on each other. There's quite a bit of uh, uh, going back and forth between the two countries、uh, that gives us, you know, a lot of touch points、uh, where things could possibly change. And the situation is different from the Ukraine situation. What would a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, if it happens, mean for your country? Uh, do you believe that American security guarantees are enough for Japan? Do you need an independent defense policy? Well, being that、uh, geographically、uh, Taiwan is very close to Japan, we're only 110 kilometers、uh, apart. So, if there is a war that、uh, outbreaks in Taiwan, of course. That is going to be emergency situation for Japan and, and Japan Alliance,、uh, naming Japan U.S. You suggested that Japan should host U.S. nuclear missiles. Is that a suggestion that you still stand by? Of course, um, uh, when it comes to Japan's own defense,、um, you know we should、uh, be.、A, a, a, Enhancing our own defence, but at the same time,、uh, we I, I think that、uh, there's a, a strong alliance between the U.S. Japan when it comes to national security of Japan,、uh, specifically with regard to the nuclear、uh, deterrence power that the U.S. holds.、Uh, of course, we need to、uh, make sure that the、uh, system is uh, uh, refined over time; it's updated, uh, but. Uh, The nuclear de、uh, deterrence in itself、uh, is a firm thing; it's a sure thing, and I think、uh, it secures Japan's、uh, safety. Let's talk about your relationship with India and Prime Minister Modi. How do you describe it? Of course,、uh, we had to stop、uh, diplomatic visits、uh, during the、uh, COVID pandemic、uh, for two years. Uh, but uh, you can see the historical visits that we've made back and forth. Of course,、um, you know I was uh, 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 very uh, energetic when,、uh, when it comes to、uh, strengthening the bilateral relationship、uh, during my second、uh, administration. But I would go back as far as my first、uh, administration, where、uh, I visited India and I gave a, a parliamentary speech and I talked about the two、uh, seas being united.、Uh, this became really、uh, the concept、uh, that led to the Quad and、uh, economic. Uh, uh, collaborations、uh, thus after that we have elaborated on. I have always uh, been saying that uh, uh, this bilateral re relationship between Japan and India、uh, is the type of bilateral relationship that has the biggest potential of all.、Uh, and we are actually starting to see all the fruit、uh, of the relationship. So、uh, I'm actually going to、uh, step up as the president of Japan or Japan Indo、uh, Association. Taking a position of uh, uh, formerly served、uh, by Yoshio Mori, it has a history of 120 years. It's actually longer、uh, than、uh, U.S.-Japan-Japan-U.S. Japan -US association. 
You've also had a long association with Mr. Modi uh, in particular, and you've known him since the time that he was the Chief Minister of Gujarat. Uh, uh, can you tell us about your engagements and interactions with him? And I ask this because when two leaders meet, there's a lot of talk about personal chemistry. How much does personal chemistry, how, how big a role does it play in international diplomacy? Uh, we've spent uh, quite a bit of time, you know, talking, you know, doing other uh, matters uh, around our diplomatic uh, activities. So our relationship goes deep. Uh, our understanding towards national security, uh, the world issues that uh, we need to all uh, collaborate, solve together, uh, are uh, very much, uh, uh, you know, united. And I respect uh, Prime Minister Modi for the fact that uh, uh, he's a quick decision maker. Uh, he has that power to make things happen. I can't have an interview with you without asking about North Korea. That remains another uh, security challenge for Japan. And I know that in your tenure you, you vowed to uh, sort of restore diplomatic ties, even sought a bilateral meeting with uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un that, that did not happen. How do you assess the situation now and what do you think he's trying to do with all of these missile tests and the threat of possibly a nuclear test during Biden's Asia tour? Uh, of course, uh, when it comes to North Korea, um, in addition to the very important issue of what we shall do with the nuclear weapon that they hold, uh, Japan um, has this abduction issue uh, that we have been long trying to solve. It's important for uh, world countries to unite together um, in dissuading uh, North Korea uh, to take uh, uh, policies and positions uh, suitable to the world. And what next for you? Do you see yourself in the Prime Minister's uh, role again? Or? No. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not thinking that as of now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.